。好，那这一场呢，将由 Vladimir 介绍如何透过 M Script Turn and M N。JS 可以让你编译 C 加加专案为 JavaScript。那他除了介绍这些之外呢，还会介绍相关的开发环境以及效能，请大家掌声欢迎。Thank you, thank you. There we go.、Um, so my name is、uh, Vladimir Vukicevic.、Uh, I'm an engineering director at Mozilla, and、uh, I focus on a couple of different areas. But my main interest is making the web. The premier place to develop applications of all kinds. So today, what I'd like to talk to you is about putting native code and C++ on the web, and why that is not crazy, and why, as JavaScript developers, that's something that's actually very beneficial and can be very useful to you in your application development. So the web platform、um, in the old days was this thing with XML HTTP request.、Uh, Content replace, the blink tag, marquee—that was pretty much it. There was not a lot of capabilities.、Um, today's modern web looks very, very different than this.、Um, today we have multi-threading with web workers, we have 3D graphics with WebGL, we have a lot of local data storage with IndexedDB, we have WebRTC for real-time audio and video communication and real-time data sending. Uh, we have Web Sockets, another way to、uh, transfer data over the network.、Um, we have the File API for again storing data locally, for dealing with blobs, for dealing with、uh, things that the web traditionally has not been able to access.、Um, and, and the list goes on. We have、uh, SVG support. We have the Gamepad API for being able to use game controllers、uh, with the web.、Um, and all this changed in not very many years. And there's a few reasons why this changed. Uh, the first one is people's expectations changed. People started to want to do as much as possible on the web.、Uh, one main reason for that was mobile.、Uh, mobile is everywhere,、um, and a lot of web development now ends up focusing on mobile first because that is often one of the primary ways that users access、uh, content. And because of mobile, the operating system became irrelevant. The web itself was the operating system. Today, almost every single person uses at least two different operating systems daily. They use what they use on their computer, so Mac OS X, Windows,、uh, Linux, and then they use what they use on their phone, which is usually going to be either iOS or Android, perhaps Windows Phone. And so the operating system itself becomes much less relevant for application developers, and the web itself starts becoming the the main platform for development. But I'm talking about native development today. I'm talking about writing code in C and C++ and putting it on the web. Why do we want to do that, especially as web developers? So, like I said, the web is the main platform.、Uh, the web should be able to support all types of applications, even those that traditionally you would think you would need to do natively because you need the performance, you need to access the hardware, you need to access the graphics,、uh, you might need to access USB devices. All of these things. You would immediately think, "I can't do that as a web app." We want to make sure that that changes. And the second reason for us in Mozilla is because of Firefox OS. With Firefox OS, there are no native applications. Every application is a web application. All the capabilities that any Firefox OS application can access are just web capabilities. So, because of that, to be able to actually compete with Android and iOS and Windows Phone, we have to make sure that Firefox OS applications are as capable as possible. That they can do all the same things that a native mobile application can do, and so because of that, we have to be able to target the same kinds of capabilities as native applications.、Um, so this is a JavaScript conference.、Uh, JavaScript is here to stay. It is not going anywhere. I like JavaScript. It is a fantastic language, and I think going forward, it's going to evolve in some really amazing ways. All the stuff that I'm actually talking about today, even though it starts in C and C++, it's all only possible because of JavaScript and because of the kind of language that it is. But using native code, using C and C++ libraries, gives you a lot of options.、Uh, so it's not often the solution. So I'm not telling you, and definitely don't think that I'm telling you, that you should stop writing JavaScript and go start writing C++. That is going to be incredibly painful. Please don't do that. But if you already have a C++ application, and somebody says we need this on the web, you no longer have to think, okay, I have to rewrite this application. Uh, games are one of the areas that we've started doing、uh, this kind of work in, mainly because 
Uh, well, for Firefox OS, again, we want to have a lot of game content, but they're also very demanding. They're demanding on performance, they're demanding on graphics, they're demanding on audio, all of these things uh, so that we can prove that the platform can actually do this. And it's a very different story when you talk to a game developer and they say, well, I already have my Android game and you want me to get it on Firefox OS. If we told them you have to rewrite the entire game from scratch uh, in JavaScript, we would get no content whatsoever. There would be no interest because that is a lot of work, not just the initial development, but every time they make an update to their Android and iOS versions, which usually share most of the code, if there was a web version, they would have to redo that in JS. With the approach of being able to take C++ code and put it on the web, those people can actually take the majority of their content and have the web be just another target. It lives right next to Linux and Windows and Android and iOS. The web becomes just another porting target. But if you're writing JS, if your application is primary a, a JS one, you already have a nice JS front end that uses HTML and a bunch of advanced CSS capabilities and all of these things, um, using native code, it gives you a lot of optimization opportunities. You can look at things that say, you know, this part of, of my code is very slow. Uh, again, to use a game example, uh, you might do the entire UI in HTML and CSS and SVG. Uh, you might do uh, the chat interface, again, all in HTML using WebSockets, using whatever else. But you might have an AI component or you might have some physics simulation that you want to do. Those are the things where you can say these, that these pieces, I want to move that into native code. I want to take advantage of the performance and I'm willing to write this in C++. Maybe you might hire a C++ developer to work alongside your JavaScript team. Maybe there already exists an open source package you can then cross compile and use directly. But you can look at the places where your code is slow and think about this as a way to optimize it, to use it as an optimization technique. So there's a couple of pieces that enable uh, native development. Uh, the first one is a tool called Emscripten. Uh, this is a tool that was developed by Dr. Alon Zakai at Mozilla, a uh, really smart guy. And he had this idea a few years ago that it should be possible to take C and C++ code, run it through a compiler called LLVM, and then from the back end generate JavaScript code. Um, he showed me this idea uh, again about two, two, three years ago, and my first thought was, wow, that's kind of cool, but that's probably gonna be a toy. There's no way that it will ever be fast enough. Um, it turns out it was definitely fast enough. Uh, even his initial experiments, uh, just with no code changes or anything, he was getting performance that was maybe about five times to 10 times slower than native code. That's not great. Uh, because you know it's it's one tenth of the performance at, in the worst case, but at the same time we're not talking about a hundred times, two hundred times, one thousand times for taking existing C++ code, getting it on the web. But the next piece that enables uh, native development is something called Asm.js. This is a dialect of JavaScript. It's still just JavaScript, but it can be used as a target for Emscript and for other compilers to give the JS engine some hints and information about how to optimize that code. Using asm.js, Emscripten compiled code tends to run at about half the speed of the native code, so only a 50% slowdown. That becomes very interesting uh, because at that point, the difference between processing an image in 200 milliseconds versus 100 milliseconds is not very significant. Doing it in 200 milliseconds versus two seconds, that becomes painful. But as soon as you start talking about a 50% slowdown with the potential to make it even faster, all of a sudden, native development becomes very, very real. And the third thing is that the web platform has grown. Um, there are web platform capabilities now that directly translate into native APIs that native developers are used to using. Uh, without this, we would be stuck because we would have no way to easily port uh, all the graphics capabilities, all the audio usage, and all of these things that native apps do uh, to get them on the web. So what is uh, asm.js? Um, asm.js is just JavaScript, but it is a strict form of JavaScript. There is a specification that says for something to be valid asm.js, it has to look exactly like this. Uh, there are no objects in asm.js. There's only functions. There's references to the heap, which are just typed arrays, which is something else that JavaScript gained uh, not too long ago. Uh, then there's math. That's basically it. Um, so it looks a little bit like this. Uh, this is the traditional native code string length operation. Uh, it takes a pointer, but that pointer is just an integer. 
It's just a number as far as JavaScript is concerned. And it uses that to index into its heap, the, the mem8 array. And you'll see these things called the, the, the or zeros in this. Um, what that does is that tells the JavaScript engine the result of this is always going to be an integer. It's never going to be a double. It's never going to be a string. It's never going to be an object. It's always going to be an integer number. Um, and that's because the JavaScript language itself defines that operation to always result in an integer. And there's a couple of these things that are called type annotations. And they're the key to what asm.js is. It lets the JavaScript interpreter have a lot more knowledge about what you're actually doing, what the code is actually doing. So with asm.js, like I mentioned, we get to 50% of native code performance, um, twice as slow. This is a really good thing. Because like I said, when you're 50% slower, all of a sudden, you're in the realm of possibility. Um, this number also, this, uh, our current, excuse me, the asm.js implementation in Firefox today is the result of about two months of, of work by one person. So this was basically the first version that they got working, and it's already this fast. There's a long list of optimizations that they have planned that they're already working on that should bring this number even closer to native code performance. It should be possible to get to within, you know, hopefully, 10%, 5% of native performance, where there just isn't much difference uh, be between the two. So let me talk a little bit about the native web platform. Um, you're probably familiar with many of the capabilities of, of the modern web today. Uh, but if you're developing for the native web, taking a native application and putting it on the web, your language choice is probably going to be C or C++. Uh, there are other tools uh, that will take C Sharp or Java, such as Google web, to uh, web Toolkit and others, and get those into JavaScript. But those often have not had as much of a, a focus on performance. And the input language is also not as amenable to uh, the same kind of performance optimizations. So generally, you're going to start with C or C++. Uh, for any graphics output, the main thing you're looking at is OpenGL ES 2.0, which conveniently is exactly the same API that WebGL uses. So any native code that already exists for OpenGL ES, uh, such as a lot of uh, Android and iOS games, basically any Android apps and iOS apps that use graphics, they can already be brought over directly. Uh, audio, uh, there's a native API called OpenAL, which has very similar capabilities to what's exposed by web audio today. Uh, Firefox just recently implemented web audio. Chrome has had it for a little while now. But that's kind of the, the future going forward for getting uh, audio on, uh, in, in apps. You also have some simple audio playback via HTML5 audio that's been there for a while. <laughs> on the input side, um, we, on, when you're developing an application and porting it with Emscripten, there is a native library called SDL. Uh, this has been around for quite a while, and it is a simple way, simple cross-platform way to do things like open windows, get an OpenGL context, uh, read keyboard and mouse events, all of these things. Emscripten includes an implementation of the same API so that if your native app runs using SDL, you can just compile it directly with Emscripten, and it'll just come up in the web. It'll handle events, it'll handle mouse input, it'll display windows, all of these things uh, in the same way. And the web already has things like the GamePad API and the accelerometer uh, and, and all those, uh, GPS, geolocation. So you can use those as input of, uh, events as well. On the networking side, uh, we have TCP and UDP sockets via WebRTC. Again, a new addition to the web stack, but that enables a large class of native applications. And then because it's the web, you can always make HTTP requests using H uh, XML HTTP request. And finally, on the storage side, um, we have an emulated file system using IndexedDB. Again, a new addition to the web stack, but one that's key to making a lot of the native applications possible. And of course, on the web, you've got other cool stuff. You have uh, full screen mode now, where you can take an element, put it directly uh, full screen. You can lock the user's pointer. So again, for games, if you want to do a first person shooter type game, either they can actually move the, the view normally without having the mouse cursor in the way. Um, and pretty soon you'll have camera access and you know microphone access via get user media. So at the beginning of the talk, I said that uh, native development is really a tool that you can use alongside uh, regular JS development. And so there are really two development approaches. Uh, the first one is pure C and C++. 
you take an existing full C and C++ application, you port it to use the, the same native libraries that Emscripten supports, so that's things like SDL, OpenAL, all of those things, and you develop, debug, and test the native version. So you do all your development using Visual Studio, GCC, Xcode, uh, whatever you might be familiar with as a native developer. And then as a final step, once everything works there, then you compile it with Emscripten and, and bring it into the web. At that point, your application is really just kind of a rectangle onto the screen. Uh, it can interact with the web in other ways, but if you're bringing it over like this, it's generally because you already have the application. Uh, you already have, for example, an Android game, and you want to just bring the whole thing over to the web. So let me actually show you one demo of, of this approach. Um, some of you have probably seen at the Game Developers Conference, Mozilla, along with Epic Games, uh, showed off a demo of Unreal Engine 3 running in the browser, ported using Emscripten, and compiled with, uh, with Asm.js. Should be running here, there we go. So this is about a million lines of code. Um, and this is an engine that runs on Xbox, PlayStation, um, PCs, everywhere basically. And it's using OpenGL ES2 for rendering. Uh, it's a little dark up there, but you can still kind of, you know, get the, get the main thing. But this was all ported using Emscript and Asm.js in about a week. Um, and it was a very, very fast way to get the engine and all of the content uh, running directly in the browser. Um, this is also, by the way, this is running just off my little Asus Ultrabook here. This is not some kind of crazy beefy machine. Um, you know, this is hardware that, uh, that most people have. And, it, you know, it's running this at something like 30, 40 frames a second um, with, without very many problems. Um, and this, again, this is before we've done a lot of the additional uh, optimizations that Asm.js can provide. So while this is cool, um, this is probably not that interesting to you guys because as JavaScript developers, you're not going to throw all that away and go start writing C++. So the other development approach is when you mix JavaScript and C++. Um, you look at your app and you identify portions of the app that need native code. Uh, like I mentioned before, you might have a photo editor where the photo processing itself is slow. You might have a game where the physics simulation is, is slow. Uh, you might have, boy, I, I'm not really sure, kind of many other examples, but there's, anytime you have kind of a, a single chunk of processing that needs to be done, it's always a candidate for bringing to native code. Uh, when you do that, you can create a library and you can create interfaces for these. You write that in C++, or you can look at the many open source C++ projects that are out there that support many of these things. Once you have that piece, you can then run it either synchronously in the main thread or you can run it in a web worker. So let me give you another example of this here. So this is something actually that I put together um, just yesterday while on the plane over to here. Um, I recently got a new camera. I got a Nikon D800, so 36 megapixels, uh, very large raw files, I think around uh, 40 megabytes uh, raw files. And normally you would need to throw all this stuff into something like Adobe Photoshop or Adobe Lightroom to load those files, manipulate them. It's you know something like 5,000 pixels by 7,000, I wanna say. I forget the exact kind of full, full resolution. Um, but I realized that there were libraries, C++ libraries and tools, uh, open source ones, that can read and parse raw files and can convert them you know, with, with various uh, uh, color choices and all that kind of stuff, like the, the same manipulation you would get in something like Lightroom. And so I took one of these libraries uh, called Libraw and I compiled it with Emscripten. It took maybe about 20 minutes. Uh, there were no changes necessary. And the performance that I got is right there where I expected it to be which is about 2x of native. So this is taking uh, one raw file, reading it straight from the disk, processing it through DC raw, and then displaying the output in a canvas. Uh, because I did this on the plane, you can't you know, zoom in and do all these things, but this is you know, the full 36 megapixel image that just went through the browser and was displayed. Um, so you can think of, for example, if you're somebody like Flickr, uh, who traditionally has not offered uh, raw file uh, storage, or at least not raw file display, you can then think about, oh, wait a minute, maybe I can actually take something like Adobe Light then and put the whole thing on the web, put all the capabilities on the web, so that no matter where the user is at, no matter what computer they're at, they have access to their entire library, they have access to all the same functionality, all the same uh, 
uh, photo transformations, editing tools, all of these things, but they can do it anywhere, on any computer, uh, perhaps even for a mobile device. Um, let's see, let me close this up, there we go. So yeah, like I said, compiled Libra with Emscripten. Um, the, the code for Libra executes in a web worker. I wanted to do that because I didn't want to block the main thread. As you saw, it still takes about three or four seconds for it to process uh, the image data. But by putting all this in a web worker, um, you can let, take advantage of multi-threading and let the main browser still be fully responsive uh, and just wait for the result. Um, and any Emscript and compiled code works just fine coming, uh, uh, coming in a web worker. So the application sends a message with the raw file URL to the web worker. The worker then calls into the native asm.js code uh, to do the image decode. It gets the result back as an array buffer with the RGB data in it. And then the app displays the image using Canvas. Everything other than the processing was some simple HTML and JS. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time making the UI very pretty, but like I said, you can imagine blowing that out with kind of the regular web technologies, no native technologies, to make the UI functional, to expose more of the functionality of Libra, and just calling into there to do the actual data processing. Once you have an application um, that is either a fully native port, like for example a game, or even one of these, um, you actually have a lot more deployment options than, uh, than just putting it kind of behind a URL on the web. This is actually nothing that really applies directly to just native apps, this is kind of in general. Um, but one of the comments, excuse me, one of the things that I noticed when we were talking about Asm.js apps, uh, especially the uh, Unreal demo, that demo has about 300 megabytes of data and the JavaScript file uh, for the engine is about 40 megabytes of JavaScript. So that is a large chunk. And one of the, the comments that people made online was, do you really expect people to download this every single time uh, when they want to play this game or when they want to kind of interact with your app? Um, and the answer is really no, because there's a lot of ways to get kind of the content into the user's hands and onto the user's computer. Uh, the first one is obviously streaming or on demand. This is your typical web app. You give the user a URL, they go there, you send them all the things, maybe the, the browser takes care of some caching, and you don't really kind of do anything. That works, that will always continue to work. It's not necessarily the most efficient, especially if the user has to wait, again, for you know, a 300 megabyte download every time they want to access your app, if they need all the graphical data, or even just you know, 20 megabytes of JavaScript or something like that. Um, the other option is the HTML5 app cache. Um, this is not perfect, um, it's actually quite bad, and there's work ongoing to fix it to actually make it a little bit more usable for developers. Uh, the HTML5 app cache has been around for at least, I think, three or four years, and very few people use it because it is painful to use, um, and it often doesn't actually do what you want. But now that we have a lot of interesting new web technologies like IndexedDB, you can actually do a bunch of self-caching. You can store your JavaScript data, you can store all your binary data, whatever assets you need, directly to IndexedDB database, write a small piece of JavaScript that will act as a loader, that will look at and say, do I have the latest version of all the things that I need locally in IndexedDB? If so, great, load them, parse them, execute them, and you're done. Otherwise, fetch them over the network and update the local cache. And then there's also the option to create a packaged app. Uh, this is the main way that you deploy apps on Firefox OS where you take all of your assets and you basically just zip them together. Uh, you include a simple manifest that describes the app and gives it a title, gives it an icon, all of these things. Um, and on the desktop, when you, on Firefox desktop, um, when you trigger the install uh, mechanism from a web page, you can actually install an icon on the user's desktop that will launch the, the HTML app in a separate instance of Firefox and it'll feel uh, much more like a native app. Um, and like I said in Firefox OS, all apps are essentially this. Um, all apps are either packaged or they might just be a link to a site, but they all end up looking and behaving kind of the same way. So especially with packaged apps, um, at that point you have a very traditional uh, native app deployment model. Uh, if I go and purchase Microsoft Word, um, I generally have to go and download their you know, 200 megabyte installer and then I install it and run it. Um, with a packaged app, you can do the same thing. Uh, you can click the install thing, it'll download the, the app package locally and then it'll execute it but you do have options because you can also uh, be executing uh, even while it's loading. Uh, you can take advantage of the streaming bits 
to just run the app, let the user interact with it, download it in the background, and then once that's done, you can switch to using those versions of the assets. So this is where, where we are today um, with bringing native code into the web. Uh, we can take large-scale applications, uh, compile them wholesale, we can take libraries and bring them in um, at about 2x slowdown. The way we're gonna move beyond that is we're going to need improvements to JavaScript and to ASM.js. Uh, something called value types is coming to JavaScript, uh, which are basically, uh, if you are a C or C++ developer, you can think of them as structs. Uh, in JavaScript, all complex types are objects, uh, but with value types, they are just basically values. Um, and this is where we can do things like SIMD. Uh, this is symmetric, uh, excuse me, Oh, I forget what it, what it stands for now, but basically this is uh, things like uh, SSC instructions on Intel chipsets that allow for really fast uh, video and audio and just data processing. We can bring that same stuff into JavaScript uh, through ASM.js and through value types, which are coming soon in a, in a future version of JavaScript. Um, the other main area is multi-threading. Um, a lot of native apps want to take advantage of multiple native threads, um, but web workers don't really cut it for them. Uh, because they often need to share a lot more data than web workers usually do. Web workers just let you pass messages back and forth, uh, and that usually is not the way that native apps are structured uh, for multi-threading. So we're doing some work to figure out how to enable uh, native apps that are fully multi-threaded on the web. Additionally, we want to make web workers themselves, or really kind of any web parallelism uh, approach, fully capable. Uh, today in web workers, you have access to XML HTTP request, uh, you have access to IndexedDB, um, and a few other things, but that's really it. Uh, we want to bring as many of the APIs, especially those that are not tied to the DOM, into web workers as we can. Uh, we want you to be able to use Canvas 2D and WebGL in a web worker. Uh, we want you to be able to use web audio in a web worker, um, to use web sockets, to use all of these things uh, that you can right now do on the main, in the main app, but not in a worker because there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to parallelize those things if it makes sense for your app. And then we also want to evolve the graphic capabilities of the web, especially of Canvas and WebGL. Um, so there's work ongoing right now on WebGL 2 based on OpenGL ES 3.0, which is the latest version of that standard um, that mobile chipsets that are shipping this year are just now starting to support. So we wanna make sure that the web is ready once those actually start getting into the hands of users. So let me actually show you a couple more demos before we get to questions, uh, because people have done some really interesting stuff with the ability to port uh, their apps. Um, what we saw is that people are, uh, once you give, once you have a tool like Emscripten that makes it relatively easy, people will try it with various things. Um, so this is uh, a game called the Drakensang Online, and it's based on an open source 3D engine called the, the Nebula Engine. And the author, at first, was very kind of skeptical of being able to take his code and get it running on the web. Um, with very little help from uh, Alone or from Mozilla, he actually took and he ported um, the engine uh, to, to the web. So this is not the full game, but this is just kind of the engine. Uh, but you can see it runs quite well. This little guy kind of runs around. You can look around the map, do all these things. And I think this was not a lot of effort on his part. Um, and just like I did with the Libra example uh, yesterday, um, it's very easy to say, you know what, I need a certain capability on the web. A native library exists for it that's already quite fast. I wanna figure out how I can pull that into my web app and how I can kind of take advantage of it. One more thing before, oh no, wait, actually I cannot run that one on this because unfortunately, like I said, this is an ultrabook and there are some things that it will cry if I do. So, that's it. Um, I hope you have uh, gotten a good idea of how native app development can be beneficial to you as JavaScript developers and how it is not a completely foreign world. Uh, there are ways to meld the two where it can be very beneficial and uh, can add new levels of performance uh, to your web apps and to your JavaScript uh, development. So, uh, any questions? We've got about, uh, oh, about 10 minutes left. Uh, is every, I mean, every uh, C++ project can convert to ASN.js or you have some limit or something like that? Uh, 
there really are no limits. Um, the, the main thing is it depends on what libraries that project uh, already uses. Um, Mscripten has a number of implementations of things like SDL, OpenAL, uh, OpenGL, ES, all of those. Uh, if it's using something totally foreign to access the Windows system to do graphics, there might be some more work. Uh, but if it's using something that's already understood, it's pretty straightforward. Right there. Right. Hi. Um, so, so on a mobile device, um, a memory constraint is quite serious. So, so how does Inscription or ASN.js take care of that? Or how far are we from getting native memory consumption? So the one kind of main constraint that Inscription uh, and Asm.js generated code has is that it wants you to allocate a fixed size uh, array for its sort of memory heap. And you have to pick what that number is. Um, depending on what the application is, that might be 32 megabytes, might be 64, might be one gigabyte. Uh, for example, the Unreal demo uh, that I showed earlier, I think that's using 64 megabytes, maybe 128 um, as the heap. Um, so that part is generally OK. Uh, you can, and, and, and that translates directly to what the app would use uh, if it was a native app anyway. Um, but of course, there's overhead from the browser and all of those pieces. Um, the current problems are because the ASM.js generated JavaScript code is so large, actually parsing it and loading it takes a lot of memory. Um, and that's something that we're working to, to improve right now. Um, we're actually writing a separate parser just for ASM.js so that we don't have this kind of big spike in memory. Um, but th that, that Citadel demo, again, the, the Epic demo, uh, that was at one point targeted uh, with a lower set of assets that was targeted at a mobile device. And we're hoping that we can actually get that same content running on Firefox for Android uh, within a few months uh, when we do some of this work. Uh, why do we need ASM.js? Uh, why just make the uh, JavaScript JIT compiler better and faster instead? You can do that. Y you can do both. Uh, ASM.js basically just gives the JIT compiler a lot of information about how to actually optimize. Um, it lets it kind of recognize and basically it, it allows it to be dumber until it gets smarter. Um, if you had a perfect JIT compiler, you, we would not need ASM.js. Or rather, sorry, let me say that. If you had a perfect JIT compiler, um, you would be able to write ASM code and it would, write, it would execute at the same speed as a compiler that explicitly understood ASM.js code. Uh, but nobody has that perfect JIT compiler now. Maybe in a year or two, you won't actually need the, the use ASM string. Um, but for now, this is a way to actually get the performance uh, directly on the web. But at the end of the day, it's just JavaScript. If a, a JavaScript engine can get the same or better performance without actually doing anything explicit for asm.js, that's awesome. Uh, yep. Do you follow up? Um, so uh, something like sync instructions in asm.js, um, uh, I want to ask, does it make uh, multi-platform, um, like uh, some, some platform like PowerPC or uh, MISP, um, these platforms of Firefox porting, uh, porting, porting Firefox to this platform, does it make it more difficult? No, because uh, if you port the JavaScript interpreter, or excuse me, if you port the full JavaScript JIT, uh, you get ASM.js as a side benefit. It, it uses the exact same infrastructure that the current JIT does. It's not a separate JIT at all. So if, if you port the current SpiderMonkey JIT, you get ASM.js support as a benefit. Now, those architectures have different problems because they're big endian. Um, and most of the, especially typed arrays, are all defined to be little endian. And so there might be issues with actually executing the code, um, but porting the, the JITs in ASM.js itself uh, should, be, should, should not be an issue. Uh, I got a uh, couple of questions. Uh, first, uh, when you are uh, writing a C and C++, you probably uh, won't be concerned that your business logic is going to uh, exposed um, to the uh, people. Yeah. But now, once you have compiled your uh, C and C++ to uh, ASM, uh, ASMJS, you're going to um, uh, uh, expose your business logic. And uh, is this a valid concern? Is a way to help uh, um, improve this condition. Uh, and uh, my second question is about debug. When you uh, develop, uh, you actually um, you actually are writing C++ when, 
but yet, uh, once it has, uh, it has it's done, it's you are actually running uh, in a uh, in in a browser and it's running JavaScript. So is the only way to have debugging uh, easier by using source map or yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. and uh, uh, Liz, the third question. Oh, yeah. well, hold on, l l uh, let me let me answer those two first, or I'm going to uh, forget. Okay, uh, sorry. Um, so the, the first question: um, Does compiling the C++ code to JavaScript expose either your business logic or any kind of private logic that you might not want exposed? Um, the answer is no, uh, because just like today, you can obfuscate and minify JavaScript so that it's completely unintelligible. Um, you can do the exact same thing with MScript and compiled ASM.js code. Um, even actually, it's even less intelligible just at the beginning because it's so low level. Um, it is no different than just taking a native binary and disassembling it and looking at the assembly output. Uh, you get roughly the, the same level of, uh, of, of view in, 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 into what the code is doing. Um, we've been talking to a number of fairly high end, uh, again, especially game developers, because they're the ones that are most interested in this initially, um, and none of them really have this concern. Um, they often ask the question, but as soon as they kind of see what the resulting code looks like, it, it's not an issue. Um, and to answer your second question, um, for debugging support, uh, once you actually compile the C and C++ code into JavaScript, what does debugging look like? Um, the answer right now is that it looks very bad. Um, if you take the uh, C and C++ code and compile it with some flags in Emscripten, you can get something that's mostly readable. Um, you can sort of at least uh, follow things at a function by function level. Um, you'll often get local variables so you can inspect and those, and those things, um, but it's definitely not a full native debugging experience. So what we usually tell people is if they're doing porting or if they're doing uh, even library development, get it working natively first in the exact same build configuration that you would use for Emscripten and only then compile it with Emscripten. Uh, that way you'll have many fewer bugs to, to deal with. Um, that's something that we did not do when we were porting the uh, Unreal Epic demo and it hurt us. Uh, because we spend probably two or three days trying to debug what were actually engine bugs and issues in the JS code instead of just doing it on, on the native side. And you had one more question? Uh, my last question is related to the second one. And uh, well, well, once you have compiled that to uh, in script and, uh, because you are uh, developing in, in C and C++ and uh, your test code must be written in C and C++, mm -hmm. then is there a way to still able to test these compiled result? Uh, if sorry, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. The, the code is written in C and C++, so you're trying to see how you can test the, the compiled result. Uh, yes, yes, it's, yeah. Is there a way to tell, test the compiled result? Yeah. It, uh, other than just executing it in, in the browser? Uh, yes. I mean, you can execute it using a, a command line JS interpreter, depending yeah. on what it is. But is there a, a, a way to test them efficiently? Because I have already my uh, just uh, my uh, test case ready in C and C++. Ah, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you can just compile the, the, those test cases directly, just as applications, and just run them on the command line uh, using either the SpiderMonkey command line interpreter or Node.js or any of these, and mm. it'll just print uh, straight out to uh, as, you, as if you were running a, a native app. There's actually, I should mention, I forgot, um, there is a talk this afternoon uh, on Emscripten, specifically how to use Emscripten to actually do some of these things. Um, and uh, he should be covering that, so you should definitely check that out. All right, I got time for probably two more questions. Yep. Sorry, I, I would like to follow up the second question. Mm -hmm. um, so is there a plan or is it even possible to, to enable source map capability from Emscripten so that we could debug, uh, uh, debug native code in, since say, browser right. debugging tools. Yes, there absolutely is a plan to, to enable source map capability and to actually make uh, native code debugging possible uh, in the browser. Um, we're a little ways away from there yet. Like, I would not expect it before the end of the year, maybe. Um, largely because it hasn't been as pressing of a need. Uh, because you can do a lot of the, the development and debugging natively, uh, most of the bugs kind of get worked out there. All right, one more question. All the way in the back. A very impressive talk. Uh, so my question relates to the content streaming issue you talk about. Mm -hmm. Are there, is it possible that some kind of uh, perhaps distributed peer-to-peer -peer or CDN um, uh, sort of integrated approach can be done for the content streaming aspect that works along with the, uh, I mean, the WebGL? Uh, it can. Uh, a lot of, for example, I don't know if you saw that uh, 
the Drake and Sang online, the little game with the guy running around, um, that actually, it was already loaded when I, uh, when I switched to it, but that streams in the content uh, dynamically. So when you first load it, all you see is just, you know, little cubes. And then as the assets get loaded, they get replaced with the actual models. Um, so you can build that logic directly into your application. Um, I don't think it's a capability that the browser or the web platform itself will directly offer, just because all the pieces are there to already enable it. Uh, it's no different than something like Google Maps that streams in tiles or any of that. Uh, you can already take advantage of similar things um, to, to get it into, into these kinds of apps. All right, I think that is it. Thank you very much. Thank you for very much sharing, and uh, it's time up, and uh, 